So do you want okay. to start now? Yes. Right. Okay. So good morning, everyone, and uh, welcome to the West Talks uh, speaker series. Uh, today is 21st of April, and uh, we are welcoming spring with a very nice talk today. And the West Talk is uh, hosted jointly by IC Impacts and uh, UBC Future Waters together with University of uh, Victoria. And here is the organizing committee for the West Talks. Uh, we have Abhishek uh, Dutta, Leli Abkar, Fuhar Dikshit, and Carl Zimmerman from uh, University of British Columbia, myself from University of Guelph, uh, Kelsey from University of Victoria, and uh, we also have Feria from uh, IC Impacts. Uh, so this is the global map of uh, where our speakers are coming from. We always like to share this uh, before our talk. So uh, we will put a link in the chat. So if you have not done so already, you can uh, use this link and let us know where you're coming from. Um, this is our speaker lineup. So we have some really interesting talks uh, coming up and today we are fortunate to have uh, Dr. Jenny Zanobio uh, from UC Irvine uh, among us, uh, who will be delivering a talk on uh, PFAS treatment strategies. Um, also, I would just like to mention that the previous West Talk uh, talks, which are recorded, they are available on our IC Impacts YouTube channel. So we can also share a link for the channel with you in the chat box. Uh, so you can uh, visit and have a look. Okay, so uh, uh, Dr. Jenny uh, Zenobio is an environmental chemist and ecotoxicologist working at Jacobs Engineering Group since 2021. Dr. Zenobio focuses on research and innovation projects related on uh, to emerging contaminants. Her research background reflects an interdisciplinary framework combining engineering, toxicology, chemistry, and nanotechnology. Dr. Znobio was a chancellor's postdoctoral fellow in the Department of Civil and Environmental Engineering at the University of California at Irvine. Her research work entailed the study of microplastics as transport vectors for PFAS affecting the health of plants and soil organisms. Dr. Znobio earned her PhD in environmental chemistry from Purdue University, while her research was performed at Harvard University. Her PhD focused on in situ technologies for degrading PFAS. Dr. Zanobio earned her MSc in Environmental Toxicology from Purdue University and her BSc in uh, Sanitary Engineering from the National University of Engineering in Lima, Peru. And uh, thank you, Dr. Zanobio. We are fortunate to have you among us. Also, I would like to mention that uh, if you have any questions, you can please uh, use the chat box to input your questions. After the talk is over, we will have a 15 minutes approximately for the question and answer round. So we will monitor the questions that you put in the chat box. So thank you, uh, uh, everyone. And with that, uh, Dr. Zanobio, I would like to uh, transfer this virtual stage to you. Thank you. So I'm having some problems with my internet, so I will uh, stop my video and then I will put it back um, <clears throat> for when I start the questions. Just give me one minute. Okay. <clears throat> okay. Uh, thank you everyone for the invitation uh, to present today. Uh, as uh, mentioned before, I'm Jenny Zenovio on environmental engineering, and today I will start, uh, I will talk about uh, PFAS treatment strategies. So I did my PhD in remediation of PFAS, a really hard topic because these chemicals are called the forever chemicals, meaning that they're really resistant to degradation process. Um, oops, sorry. So, uh, my agenda for today, I will start with an introduction, a little bit of background uh, about PFAS and, and why, why I'm talking about them right uh, today, because what is important to look for mediation treatment for uh, this kind of chemicals. Removal technologies available and currently used for PFAS treatments. So an oxidation treatments available and which one are actually effective for PFAS degradation, reductive uh, treatments also, and which one will work for a specific PFAS. And I will uh, 
finally we'll start talking about my PhD research, which was uh, specifically in a reductive treatment for uh, degradation of uh, one of the most studied PFAS. And I will finish my presentation with some summary points. So PFAS is a persistent organic pollutant, uh, meaning that it's uh, on a chemical of environmental concern because if the accumulative, the hard life is pretty high, can be, stay, uh, can be in the environment for several years without any transformation. Uh, it's very resistant to uh, conventional uh, water treatment process. And that's why it's uh, uh, passing without any transformation uh, through the wastewater treatment process available, currently available. So uh, there is the, the most used technology right now for uh, degrading these chemicals is mostly incineration after ca capturing the, the, the PFAS chemical by uh, GAC. Um, I'm just showing here a couple of other uh, persistent contaminants. PFAS right now, in, in this couple of years, uh, is getting a lot of attention because those are uh, several chemicals that have pretty similar properties, which also make uh, the life for environmental engineering and environmental scientists more difficult to, to find a specific solution for a ho the whole family. So what are PFAS? PFAS are uh, synthetic organic compounds that were created like in the 1940s that have a lot of fluorine atoms. Uh, they their carbon chain can have uh, carbon and fluorine bonds from uh, two, 2 to 16 carbons. The most study of the PFAS are the PFOA and the PFOS, which have a similar structure with the carbon uh, with eight carbons in their, uh, in their structure. So when we are talking about PFAS, we are not talking about one single chemical, we're talking a family. Uh, there was a paper that was actually published a um, couple of weeks ago where it say that depending of, uh, uh, the, depending on uh, how we are defining PFAS, we can have like 1.8 million different PFASs currently produced and likely uh, disposed in the environment. Uh, uh, there is still a lot of research going on right now to try to discover new PFAS that are possible to be in the environment. There is very few that we are able to quantify and actually measure it. So uh, every year the list uh, uh, of these chemicals that are available to quantify is increasing. I remember a couple of years ago, we were only able to measure like 20 or 24 of them. Right now, we are available to actually measure and quantify accurately around 40 of them. But the list of these chemicals are, are pretty high. So we are still uh, missing a lot of them that we are not able to see the real concentration. So they are man-made uh, highly fluorinated chemicals with unique properties. That's what they are inducing in different commercial products. They are using in textiles and food containers, in carpets, and, and they are surfactants and they're uh, used for the aqueous field forming foams. There is a, this is, this is specific for the class B foam that is using to uh, control fire uh, produced for hydrocarbons. And these chemicals are very stable and are not able to degrade by chemical thermal degradation. How they can enter to the environment? They can enter the, uh, by direct emissions or indirectly. Direct emissions are actually reduced because uh, in US and in Europe, they stop to produce two of them, not least PFOA and PFOS, but uh, other uh, PFASs are still being produced. Uh, but they also can enter to the environment but, uh, but the use of commercial products, as I mentioned before, there has been using for textile, carpets, and several other commercial products. And because wastewater treatment plants are not made to remove or degrade these chemicals, they can go back to the environment by uh, landfill applications or by direct just a emission of the wastewater effluent after treatment. 
So what is important to study PFAS because it has been detected everywhere and not only in the environment, but also in different organisms. PFAS has been detected in polar bears, in uh, dolphins, in fish of different kind of uh, fish species, and, and concentration enough to cause some problems in the population of the specific organism and to pass to, through an, uh, to another organism by the uh, food web. There is a couple technologies able to remove PFAS from the environment currently. Um, most of the people is using activated carbon uh, ion exchange are the two that uh, is uh, really uh, used uh, currently for field applications. Uh, reverse osmosis is very expensive, so people is not uh, actually happy to use that one. And nanofiltration is also have some uh, inconvenience when it is applied in the field. So the two more uses are activated carbon and ion exchange. However, these two techniques are only able to remove PFAS from the environment, but it will need a, like a, a, an additional process to destroy the PFAS. Usually people is using just uh, incineration of the uh, absorbent. Uh, I want to just mention a little bit about GAG. GAG is pretty good for remove removing some PFAS. The shorter carbon change of PFAS are not able to remove by GAC. So we are still uh, uh, having facing some problems to try to remove the whole family. So new technologies need to uh, be uh, studied to uh, see if we are able to remove the whole family <clears throat> or have like a combination of technologies to remove the when that has are more hydrophobic or less hydrophobic PFAS. So there is a couple of oxidation treatments that may work for PFAS. Fenton, Fenton reactions are not effective for PFOA or PFOS. Uh, UV reactions is only able to uh, degrade the PFOA, but it's not a uh, apply for it's not able to be applied for in situ remediation. Permanganate have some success, uh, mostly with PFOA, but uh, it requires higher temperature and low pH, which again will be uh, complicated for, uh, for in situ application in the environment. So Sonolis is, is a, an oxidation treatment that is actually show very good results for PFOA, for PFOA and for, for PFOS, but again, it's not applied for in situ. So we have another technology that is per sulfate that is using a, a heat activation, uh, which is what which was only successful for PFOA, not for the uh, PFOS, which uh, is actually the one is present a higher concentration in areas where a, a triple F was applied. So. Heat activated per sulfate, as I mentioned before, is, was able to degrade PFOA when the temp temperature was increasing and the pH uh, was also uh, adjusted. So the main mechanism is by uh, unseating uh, PFO, the PFOA molecule to, to form a smaller uh, uh, carboxylate uh, with shorter carbon change. Uh, until we can, we are able to see a complete mineralization by the formation of fluoride or uh, CO2. Uh, as I say, uh, the, the main mechanism is actually attacking the functional group, the carboxylic group. And then with multiple sequential oxidation, we can actually achieve a, a complete mineralization of the carboxylic acids. However, heat activated per sulfate was not able to degrade PFOS. PFOS were pretty stable even if the temperature was increasing to 90 degrees. Uh, so as we can see here, there is a treatment process that are able to degrade one kind of, uh, or one type of PFAS, but not able to degrade the other uh, uh, PFAS compounds, in this case, the sulfonates. However, in the environment, we will find a mixture of them. We're not finding only PFOS 
isolated in environment, we will have more uh, a mixture of several PFAS together, which uh, the technology that we are uh, trying to uh, use for remediation probably will not be effective. So in the other side, we have red, uh, reduction treatments. So there is a couple methods that has been studied for re reduction. Most of the times uh, people is looking for oxidation treatments. Uh, we saw that uh, UV photolysis was able to degrade uh, PFOS and PFOA, but only an, a, under argon atmosphere. Uh, vitamin B12 was uh, studied in 2008 and also in 2019. Uh, uh, vitamin B12 was, was used like a catalysis with different uh, reductants to see if there was able to degrade PFOS. Uh, uh, we saw some success, but mostly with the PFOS isomers, but not with the linear uh, change of the PFOS. So we also have a boro uh, top diamond electrode, which have success with for PFOS. However, it's also very expensive. When we are looking for um, treatment technologies, we also need to think about the cost associated with the technology, so people can actually use it for environmental applications and not only be able to, to, to be up a use it in the, in the lab. So the last one that also uh, has been studied is cerebellin iron, which is a, a very common reductant used for several other uh, organic contaminants with success. Uh, the paper published in 2005 uh, actually show a pretty high degradation of PFOS but again, the temperature and the pressure were pretty high near to supercritical uh, conditions, which again makes things more complicated for in situ environmental applications. So if we actually see uh, um, or compare this technology, we can actually believe or have the hypothesis that PFOS is actually able to degrade by reduction treatments. So looking a little bit more deeper in the results for vitamin B12 using uh, the titanium citrate like uh, a reductant, uh, this paper was published in 2005 by Ochoa where uh, she saw a degradation of PFOS, but the degradation again was only to the PFOS isomers, not to the linear uh, uh, isomers. So, uh, but however, the conditions required for this degradation are, again, very specific and probably not applying for in situ applications. So we need a temperature of 70 degrees, as you can see here, uh, to have some uh, degradation. And it was proven by the formation of fluoride. We also need to have like a very high pH around night and to, to, to be able to, uh, to degrade the, the PFOS isomers. And you need both, not just a reductant, you also need a catalysis that in, in this case was vitamin B12 to be able to see the radiation. Otherwise, just by the reductant treatment is, was not a, possible to degrade this chemical. There is another study published in 2017 uh, using also vitamin B12 a combining with another reductant, uh, this time was nanoparticles or thing. Um, and, and again, uh, they saw uh, degradation of the PFOS uh, isomers, but uh, the linear uh, form of PFOS was completely stable. Uh, so we saw really good results with using vitamin B12. However, in the environment or, or the composition of PFOS is like, uh, 70% of the linear uh, isomer and only 30% of the branch PFOS. So we need a technology that is able also to degrade the linear PFOS, which is also found in the environment at a, a like higher concentration compared to the branch. Uh, also another disadvantage of this technology of vitamin B12 that's it's more expensive. So with that, we start looking for cerebellin iron. Uh, as a reductant. Uh, this paper was published in 2005, I think. 
and uh, using uh, very high conditions like pretty high temperature pressure, uh, but uh, they saw a complete mineralization of PFOS and was proved by the formation of uh, fluorine, um, which means that nanoparticles or, or particles of ceramide and iron is actually able to degrade PFAS by a complete mineralization of the chemical. So uh, when I start my PhD, I start looking in these different technologies and see which one could be like a modify in order to have conditions applied in situ, but also have a, a good efficiency for the degradation of this uh, of the uh, carb uh, perfluoric sulfide chemicals. So I started looking uh, deeper in uh, in this technology, uh, cerevalent iron, uh, mainly because I, uh, cerevalent iron is a good reductant used currently for in situ applications. And then uh, we found that nanocytes uh, CVI uh, can have like a higher surface area. Uh, the particle size are in the nanometer range. They are very cost effective because iron is not uh, very expensive. Um, they will have a low environmental impact and low toxicity. And, and particles or nanoparticles or cerebral iron can be also doped with catalysts to improve direct interactivity. As we saw with vitamin B12, a reductant by itself was not able to degrade the chemical, but combining with a catalysis, in that case, was vitamin B12, it can be actually have some degradation. So we found that several valent iron can actually dope it with some uh, metals to improve reactivity. So the main uh, mechanism uh, for degradation using cerevalent iron, it could be by direct electron transfer uh, of the nano of the particles <clears throat> with a, a target contaminant. It can be by hydrodefluorination uh, on the catalysis surface, or can be a hydrodefluorination in the on the surface of the nano of the nanoparticle. Oh, so these uh, three mechanisms are not excluded, so it can be all three happening at the same time in the surface of the particles or the surface of the catalyst. So with that, I will start to introduce a little bit very general information about my PhD research because of the time of the talk today. Uh, I use, as I mentioned before, nanoparticles of cerevalent ions. I try to improve the conditions to have good de degradation of PFAS and in the same time, um, reduce the current conditions used by previous uh, papers where we saw like a temperature of 350 degrees, uh, which is pretty extreme, and a pressure of uh, 20 megapascal that are not able to apply for in situ uh, treatments. Uh, we saw that uh, because zero, uh, well, general nanoparticles likes to aggregate, and if they are met metallic nanoparticles, they, they like to be together. So we were looking for ways to actually separate the particles, keep it dispersed to increase the surface area, and in the same time, increase the reactivity of the particles. We also were looking for addition of different catalysis to improve also the reactivity of the nanocomposites. So with that, we actually were looking for nickel, a copper, uh, palladium, magnesium, and, and, and other uh, metals to increase the reactivity of the nanocomposite. We decided to choose activated carbon for like a support media to disperse the nanoparticles because we want to keep the nanocomposite a cost-effective treatment. So we don't want to uh, use very fancy catalysis or very fancy support media that will increase the price of the technology in the end. So we select nanoparticles of iron. We synthesize nanoparticles of iron. We select nickel as the catalysis because again, it's a, a, it's a very cheap uh, metal. And we also use uh, support media uh, activated carbon to decrease or reduce the price of the technology if it's effective. So with that, we use, as I mentioned, activated carbon and support media. We prepare 
our nanoparticles by uh, uh, iron two plus solution in the activated carbon and uh, using uh, borohydrate, we start to um, uh, precipitate the iron two plus and make uh, particles of cerebellum iron that are in the surface of the uh, activated carbon. And then we dope it with nickel. So nickel two plus solution was added in the, in the system, which was actually red reduced by cerebellum iron to form nanocomposite of iron, cerebellum iron with cellular nickel as a catalysis supported in activated carbon uh, media. <laughs> So we can see here, here's like a summary of the results. Uh, this is the nanoparticles that we made. Nano nanoparticles were in the range of 20 to 60 nanometers. Um, you will see in the figure in the left, those are like a gray um, sheet, which is uh, activated carbon with some dots that are the nanoparticles uh, of uh, NCBI. <clears throat> that were uh, taken by uh, TM and SEM for characterization. So more information about this paper, you can find it in, in, a public in our publication in the Journal of Hazard Materials. Um, uh, after the preparation of the nanoparticles, we start our batch study by mixing with a PIFA solution under anaerobic conditions because these nanoparticles are a can oxidize very quickly because they are cerebellum iron. So we keep it under nitro nitrogen atmosphere until the reaction is stopped. Uh, we are not use, we are not modifying the pH. So uh, we try to keep the conditions uh, without pH modification to, 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 to try to be uh, realistic with the, and able to be applied for uh, an environment. So we are not doing that, but we increase the temperature to in order to have some degradation. So for this, the first study we start with a temperature of 60 degrees, and then we did we did the quantification of the initial and final concentration to see the uh, removal efficiency or the degradation efficiency of uh, PFAS using this technology, and then we did a couple of quantification of organic and inorganic byproducts. With that, we saw. Uh, a complete mineralization of uh, PFOS forming uh, a sulfate and fluoride. Uh, <clears throat> this mineralization was, uh, so the degradation uh, rate was only 50% at 60 degrees, uh, but we saw of this 50%, we saw a complete mineralization of PFOS by uh, sulf sulfate and fluoride generation. We also tried to look for formation of other organic uh, uh, compounds uh, to see if uh, the fluorine uh, rate or the fluorine that we were actually, the fluoride that we, we are actually measuring uh, is not 100%. So we are looking for other organics, uh, perfluoro or polyfluoro uh, organic compounds that can be formed. So with 60 degrees, we saw like 50% degradation of PFOS. So, <clears throat> and uh, we start to look in if reducing the temperature of the, of the treatment is able, is still able to degrade this chemical. We go to 40 degrees where we don't see any degradation. We start to increase it a little bit more with 50 degrees when we saw a completely mineralization of PFOS with 100% of degradation. So increasing the temperature so was actually uh, decreasing the efficiency of PFOS or, or of the degradation of PFOS, mainly because the oxidation of iron was too quickly when we increase the temperature to 60 compared with 50 degrees. As I say, uh, we started because when we did our experience at 60 degrees, we don't see a completely formation of uh, uh, fluoride, so we look for organic byproducts of the degradation. We look for uh, formation that uh, of organic contaminants that may have like the same pattern of PFAS. So <clears throat> uh, we found uh, 
basically was a, a flooring uh, in hydrogen exchange. So we saw several organic uh, uh, byproducts forming from the degradation, a very low concentration. We saw a formation and also a, a, a degradation of the skin of, of these uh, new byproducts. So you will see like an increase of the, uh, of the byproduct, which is uh, just uh, removing one flooring of the PFOS and is changed by hydrogen and then a completely decrease. And then we saw again the formation of two fluorine uh, molecular removed by uh, hydrogen or changed by hydrogen. And then again, a completely uh, degradation of that, of this byproduct. And in the same time, we go from one fluorine to uh, seven, no, to 10 uh, exchange of hydrogen and fluorine atoms. We also saw the formation of uh, perfluoro carboxylic acids, uh, with, uh, which include PF4A, uh, C7, and the C4 of the carboxylic family. And we saw also uh, formation of uh, the sulfonate intermediate, which was mostly a C8, F17, and oxygen, which is only removing the C SO3 of the PFAS molecule. <clears throat> which that it means that uh, the degradation of the PFOS was happening uh, by um, uh, uh, by uh, uh, removing the fluorine atom and changing by hydrogen, which was quantified by uh, ion chromatography, but also by the removing of the a, a functional group of the sulfonate a, of the of the sulfonate molecular in forming uh, paraffins that were not detected by uh, a ESI, but was detected by APCI. So, and we saw that by the formation of the uh, sulfate and detected and quantified by uh, ion uh, chromatography. So with that, we saw, we started looking for some mechanisms, what is happening in this reaction. We start looking on the surface of the nanocomposite. So we look for the surface and looking for the carbon, a composition. So when we did XPS of the material before and after the reaction, we don't see any variation of the carbon composition, uh, meaning that tiber carbon is not involved in the electron transfer exactly, but it could be actually enhanced the reaction by enhancing the absorption of the PFAS molecule to the surface of the nanocomposite. Nickel was involved in the electron transfer reaction because we saw a transformation of nickel zero to uh, different nickel oxide species. And also we saw the involved of iron in the electron transfer reaction because also, again, when we are working to, the, uh, to see the uh, metal composition of, by XPS, we saw a formation of different iron oxide species. <clears throat> With that, we, we start to apply the same nanocomposite to a different PFAS is a molecule. So we <clears throat> start to look for C4 to C8 and see if there's any trend in degradation and if we are able to, de to destroy not only the PFOS but other PFAS. We saw <clears throat> a mineralization as well of other PFAS molecule, but the mineralization or the formation of fluoride was higher for the, uh, for the sulfonate group compared with the carboxylates. We also saw like the uh, slower kinetics for shorter change PFAS. And it's mostly because the, the smaller the molecular have less absorption to the nanocomposite material. This is a surface reaction. So we really need the chemical or the target compost to absorb to the surface of the material to be able to start the reaction. <clears throat> so we saw a, a trend that Higher the uh, or higher the number of the perfluorated carbons will ha have a higher formation of fluoride or sulfate, which is uh, actually uh, polished for several other treatments as well. Uh, I have a few minutes, so just a, a key summary points uh, to finish this presentation is that GAT and ion exchange are using currently in the environment for removing PFAS from water. 
However, there is additional treatments required to be able to destroy the PFAS absorbed. Uh, oxidation is efficient, efficient for re, uh, removing or degrading some PFAS, but again, we have a family of 6,000 different uh, or more that we need to discover that uh, need to, uh, will probably will need a like combination of treatments. Uh, the perforated chemical reduction is possible, uh, but uh, we have to combine it with other treatments. Uh, ultrasonic radiation is optimal to destroy PFAS uh, and will actually uh, have a complete mineralization as well, but it's not able to, for in situ applications, these nanoparticles uh, were able to transform not only the, the branch isomer, but also the linear PFAS that is approximately 70% of the PFAS composition uh, with a completely mineralization only at 50 degrees, which is a, 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 a great improvement that uh, comparing with previous research that have a temperature of 350 degrees. Um, uh, these nanoparticles were also able to degrade not only PFOS, but other uh, perfluoral, uh, uh, perfluoric uh, sulfonic substance and other carboxylates as well. Uh, fluoride and, sulf and sulfide, uh, but measured as sulfate, were the main products of the mineralization. Uh, some uh, poly and perfluorinated uh, compounds or byproducts were generated, but as we saw, they were also degraded over time with the same nanoparticles. So with that, I will say that these nanoparticles are actually very uh, good uh, option or alternative for in situ application as a permeable reactive barrier or an ex situ as a reactive column bed versus just what we are using currently like a gap sorbet there. So I was just want to thank all the people and advisors that work with me these years and the funding that actually was able or helped me to perform my research. And thank you. So I, if you have any, any questions, I'm happy to answer. Thank you so much, Jenny. This was a fantastic talk, especially on PFAS and um, nanomaterials, which we haven't had uh, previously on this talk. So thank you so much for your time. Uh, to start with, I had a quick question. Uh, and for uh, people attending, if you have any questions, please put it in the chat box. Uh, my first question was actually on what is hydro defluorination? Uh, could you emphasize a bit more on what it is and uh, how does it ha work? So uh, I can show you actually. So hydro defluorination is mostly the change of hydrogen uh, of, uh, to the fluorine atoms. It could be also like a hydro uh, dechlorination if you have like bacterial components, like chloride, a organic compound. Uh, it's mostly the exchange of the uh, hydrogen uh, molecule by the fluorine. In this case, as I show you some of my byproducts forming here, you will see like a change of the PFOS. So PFOS is C18F17. So we saw a formation of uh, intermediate or byproduct by the change of one of the fluoric atoms by hydrogen. And it continues by the formation of two hydrogen atoms by hydrogen and so on until we remove actually uh, 10 of the fluorine atoms of the PFOS molecule and change it by hydrogen. This happened because my uh, reaction, my system was in an aerobic condition, so oxygen was not present there. So the, 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 the system was actually just by nitrogen atmosphere to just keep my nanoparticles stable and uh, still reactive because if we just put it a, like in aerobic conditions, the nanoparticles will start oxidizing very quickly because we'll start reacting with oxygen. Uh, 